Since 2007, astronomers have been receiving super-strong and ultra-bright radio signals that last just a few milliseconds. Such mysterious flashes are called fast radio bursts. They seem to be coming from billions of light years away. Not so long ago, researchers were lucky enough to capture a repeating radio burst that flashed six times in a row. Who knows, it might help us crack the puzzle of these signals. But hold on, it's just the first mystery on our list. If nuclear pasta does exist, it's the strongest material in the entire universe. Formed from the leftovers of extinguished stars, this substance is squeezed into spaghetti-like tangles of material. It can break, but only after you apply 10 billion times the pressure needed to shatter steel. That single, high-energy neutrino that hit Earth in 2017 wasn't extraordinary on its own. Scientists observe such neutrinos at least once a month. But it was the first one to arrive, carrying so much information about its origin, that astronomers could actually point their telescopes in the direction it had come from. They found out that the neutrino had been flung at our planet around 4 billion years ago by a flaring blazar, a supermassive black hole at the center of a galaxy. Saturn's moon Hyperion is one of the most bizarre-looking moons in the solar system, but its appearance isn't the strangest thing about it. This pumice stone-like rock, pockmarked with countless craters, is also charged with static electricity which is flowing out into space. Lost in space and drifting through galaxies, rogue planets were once flung away from their parent stars. But one of them, 200 light-years away from Earth, is different from the rest. It's a planet-sized object with a magnetic field 200 times stronger than that of Jupiter. This field is so powerful that it generates flashing auroras illuminating the planet's atmosphere. When a team of astronomers at Louisiana State University first spotted this star, they were totally baffled. The object, nicknamed Tabby's star, dipped in brightness at irregular intervals and for odd periods of time. Sometimes the difference in brightness reached 22%. Could it be due to the activity of some alien megastructure? Unlikely. The main theory claims that the star is surrounded by an abnormal ring of dust, which causes the darkening. Dijais at one galaxy is as big as the Milky Way, but it's nearly invisible because its stars are spread out incredibly thinly. But what makes the galaxy so unique is that it's sitting all alone. Unlike other galaxies of this kind, which are usually found in clusters, it can mean that Dijisat-1 was formed in a different era, probably a mere 1 billion years after the Big Bang. If it's true, the galaxy is a real living fossil. Massive objects curve light so much that it can distort the images of objects behind them. When astronomers use the Hubble Space Telescope to detect a quasar from the early universe, they used their discovery to calculate the expansion rate of the universe. Strangely, they discovered that, currently, it was much faster than it used to be. That finding contradicted other measurements. We still don't know if our theories are wrong or if something bizarre is going on in our universe. Neutron stars are ultra-dense collapsed cores of giant stars. They usually emit X-rays or radio waves. But in 2018, astronomers discovered a weird stream of infrared light. It seemed to be coming from a neutron star 800 light-years away from our planet. This signal was probably generated by a disk of dust surrounding the star. But this theory hasn't been proven yet. Haumi, a dwarf planet orbiting in the Kuiper Belt, has a bizarre elongated shape and two moons. The day on this planet lasts four hours, making it the fastest spinning big object in our solar system. But the most enigmatic thing about Haumea is that the planet has a thin 40 mile wide ring circling it. Dark matter is believed to make up 85% of the universe, and researchers used to be sure it was everywhere. But in March 2018, a team of scientists discovered a peculiar galaxy that seemed to contain little to no dark matter. Later though, it was proven that this space oddity did, in fact, contain dark matter. Moons orbiting other moons might exist, or they might not. Astronomers haven't agreed on this yet. Planets orbit stars, moons orbit planets, then why can't there be moon moons, also known as submoons, moonets, and muons? Researchers claim that moon moons could exist, but the host moon has to be massive enough, the moon moon, small enough, and there must be a wide gulf between these moons and the host planet. Do you recognize this majestic world? The second largest planet from the sun? Check. A gas giant with a hazy yellow-brown appearance? Check. 
Seven huge, intimidating rings. Check. You're right, it can't be anything else but Saturn. And recently, the Hubble Space Telescope has made an astonishing discovery. Apparently, the planet's rings have been doing something to the planet for a long time. A new study has revealed that these iconic rings are heating Saturn's upper atmosphere. The coolest thing, though, is that researchers from NASA claim that it's something scientists have never observed anywhere else in our solar system. This secret has been hiding in plain view for 40 years. And only after using the observations of the planet received from the Hubble Space Telescope and retired Cassini probe and Voyager 1 and 2 spacecraft did astronomers figure it out. This unexpected interaction of the gas giant with its rings could become a tool for predicting if planets in other star systems have magnificent Saturn-like ring systems as well. So, how did it become clear that the gas planet is being slowly cooked by its own rings? The telltale evidence is an excess amount of ultraviolet radiation. It can be seen as a spectral line of hot hydrogen in the atmosphere of the gas giant. There's a bump in radiation that can only mean that something is heating the upper atmosphere from the outside. It's still kinda unclear how this process is happening, but the most probable explanation is that icy ring particles rain down on Saturn and cause this heating. But it might also be the impact of tiny meteorites or the particles of solar wind. The heating could be caused by solar ultraviolet radiation or some electromagnetic forces that pick up electrically charged dust. When NASA's Cassini probe finished its mission and plunged into Saturn's atmosphere, it had enough time to measure the atmospheric components. And it turned out that many particles were indeed falling from its rings. But in any case, the heating process happens under the influence of the gravitational field of the gas giant. You see, astronomers do know about the slow disintegration of Saturn's rings, but figuring out how this process affects the planet? That's new. Now, do you remember NASA's Cassini spacecraft I mentioned before? For more than a decade, it was studying Saturn, sharing images of the gas giant and its icy moons. It took us to marvelous worlds where methane rivers ran into methane seas and jets of gas and ice were blasting material into space. Anyway, that very Cassini also studied Saturn's magnetosphere. The thing is, forces acting deep inside the planet produce a ginormous magnetic bubble under the planet. And this bubble is called the magnetosphere. Unfortunately, astronomers still have very little information about this phenomenon on Saturn, since magnetic fields are invisible and are, of course, best studied from within. Imagine this. Million mile per hour flows of electrically charged particles from the Sun, aka solar wind, are spreading through the solar system. Suddenly, something appears in their way. Oh, it's Saturn's magnetic field! It protects the planet, making solar particles back away. As a result, the Sun's magnetic forces are raging outside Saturn's magnetosphere, while inside the gas giant's protective bubble, its own magnetic forces dominate. Our home planet also has a magnetic field, but it creates a much smaller magnetosphere. And still, it effectively protects us from the harmful particles coming from the Sun and from space. But even though Saturn is protected by its magnetosphere, the Sun still manages to mess with the planet. Energetic winds from our star sweep over the gas giant, causing massive auroras. But unlike auroras here, on Earth, Saturn's auroras can only be seen in ultraviolet light. In other words, they're invisible from Earth's surface. You can only see them if you travel to space. But apparently, there are different kinds of auroras on the gas giant. For example, one more type is triggered by the charged particles coming from volcanic eruptions on the planet's moons. And some of Saturn's auroras might be caused by powerful winds swirling in the planet's own atmosphere. These winds blow in the ionosphere, which is a region located beneath the magnetosphere. The same winds might be responsible for the variable rotation rate of the planet. This phenomenon makes it difficult for scientists to figure out how long one day on the ringed planet lasts. 
Speaking of winds, Saturn has a mysterious vortex swirling over the planet's south pole. The whole thing resembles an enormous hurricane-like storm on Earth, but its eye alone measures almost 2,500 miles across. For comparison, the eye of a typical terrestrial hurricane is a mere 2 to 3 miles wide. What confuses astronomers is that although the phenomenon looks like a hurricane, it doesn't behave like one. It's stationary and keeps spinning over the same area of the South Pole. And while polar vortices on Earth have cold cores, the one on Saturn is warm. And now, brace yourself for another surprise Saturn has prepared for us. In an image sent to Earth by the Hubble Space Telescope, one can notice a couple of dark, shadowy spots on the left side of the planet's rings. Those are informally called spokes, maybe because they resemble spokes on a bicycle. The shading and shape of spokes vary. They may seem dark or light, it depends on the angle and illumination. Sometimes they may even look like blobs rather than something with a classical radial spoke shape. They also don't last long. But the good news is more and more will start to appear the closer we are to May 6, 2025. That's when the autumnal equinox on Saturn will occur. Now on Earth, that's the moment when the Sun is exactly above the equator of the planet and day and night are of the same length. But on Earth, it's something a bit different. Like our planet, Saturn is tilted on its axis. That's why it has four seasons. But since the orbit of the gas giant is much larger, each of these seasons lasts about seven Earth years. An equinox occurs when Saturn's rings are tilted edge on to the Sun. But what causes the spokes? Astronomers think it might be the gas giant's magnetic field. When a planetary magnetic field interacts with the solar wind, it creates an electrically charged environment. As we already know, on Earth, this results in northern lights, also called aurora borealis. And if we speak about Saturn, the tiniest icy ring particles might get charged too. And it probably temporarily levitates these particles above the larger boulders in the rings. For the first time, the spokes in Saturn's rings were spotted by NASA's Voyager mission. It happened in the early 1980s. At that time, we didn't know that these spokes were a seasonal phenomenon. Voyager 2 just passed by the planet, after all, and then sped on. To figure out what these spokes were and how they functioned, astronomers needed a space telescope that could observe Saturn's rings from afar, like Hubble. The latest equinox on Saturn occurred in 2009. That's when the Cassini space probe was traveling around the gas giant. It sent many amazing images back to Earth. It managed to prove quite quickly that the spokes weren't caused by gravitational interactions with Saturn or the influence of the gas giant's moons or small moonlets, which make up the planet's rings. It was the year 2005 when Cassini confirmed that the spokes were related to Saturn's magnetic field. And even though that mission was finished in 2017, now, Hubble keeps its long-term monitoring of the changes on and around Saturn. Despite all the observations, astronomers still can't predict the beginning and duration of the spoke season. Luckily, Saturn's prominent rings are a perfect laboratory for studying this phenomenon. Because even though other gas giants in the solar system also have rings, those are not so visible. And scientists don't know whether spokes occur on those planets. From where we stand, the sun seems so calm and peaceful. But like humans, and basically the whole living world, the sun has its own phases when it's more or less active. It's just that the consequences are way bigger and more chaotic when the sun becomes hyperactive. Let's zoom in to see what's happening up there. So one of the ways we measure the activity of our star is by counting sunspots on its surface. Sunspots are dark patches that form when the sun's magnetic field gets all tangled up. It's simple. The more sunspots, the more active our sun is. And it seems the sun has been partying like crazy recently. The number of sunspots scientists have seen is the highest for nearly 21 years. In June, 163 sunspots appeared on the sun's surface. The last time we had so many dark patches across the sun was in September 2002, when there were 187 of them. Uh-oh. It seems this chaotic party is getting closer to its peak. And that's something we call solar maximum. 
How does all this even happen? The sun's magnetic field is strong and organized at some point. But as we said, sometimes comes the time when it kind of ends up tangled. Sort of like a ball of rubber bands that are wound together very tightly. This also means plasma is rising from the surface, forming loops and causing a mess in the shape of solar flares and something we call coronal mass ejections, CME. That's when plasma in the sun's upper atmosphere, called the corona, goes crazy and bursts really strong. Then at some point, this ball snaps and completely flips and turns the south pole into the north pole and vice versa. All this happens every 11 years or so. So when the sun comes into this phase when it becomes very active, it shoots out hot blobs of plasma, gets big dark spots as large as planets, and releases powerful eruptions of energy and radiation. Something fascinating happens when the sun becomes more active. A thing called plasma waterfall or polar crown prominence, PCP. It's like a mini eruption that starts on the sun, and it seems like it tries to get away, but then the sun's magnetic field pulls it back before it can escape into space. And this plasma waterfall is really spectacular. It goes up to 62,000 miles above the surface. It's like you stack eight Earths on top of each other. Then there's something called a polar vortex. It's like a gigantic halo of plasma that rotates around the sun's north pole really fast. This vortex happens when a large tentacle of plasma snaps apart and falls back toward the surface, similar to how a plasma waterfall forms. Scientists don't know why this plasma stays above the sun's surface for so long. And one of the cool examples of CMEs was a giant one in the shape of a butterfly in March this year. It got such an unusual shape because it exploded on the side of the sun we couldn't see, so it was impossible to fully measure how strong it was. Fortunately, that one didn't explode in our direction, but it might have hit Mercury a little bit. And it's possible it knocked off some dust and gas since Mercury has a weak magnetic field. All this sounds cool in theory, but it's not such good news for us. Because of all this, we might experience more intense solar storms that can, again, lead to geomagnetic storms on Earth. And these don't just sound alarming, they indeed are. They create chaos and disrupt the magnetic field of our planet. Geomagnetic storms can create beautiful northern lights, true. But we'd all rather enjoy such beauties as the aurora borealis in regular conditions, or just watch a good old sunset above the ocean. It's not that every solar storm will necessarily hit Earth, even if there are more of them. To reach our planet, they must be pointed in the right direction at the right moment. But if that happens, the storm can ionize the upper atmosphere and bye-bye our communications. It can cause temporary blackouts for systems such as GPS and radio. It isn't necessarily a big problem on its own, but it can be very dangerous if it happens at the wrong time, like during a tsunami or an earthquake. The storms can also damage electrical infrastructure, like rail lines and power grids. If you're on a plane at that time, you might be exposed to higher levels of radiation. It's still not clear how dangerous that will be for you, but it can be a serious problem for astronauts in space. When solar storms mess with the magnetic field, this can affect the migrations of some animals, such as sea turtles, whales, and birds. Since things in the animal kingdom mostly work in the natural order, who knows how these animals go through or even survive such changes? And when the sun is at a maximum of its activity, satellites in space are in trouble too. We have more satellites in space than ever before. And when the upper atmosphere becomes denser because of all these changes, this can push satellites in different directions. They might crash into one another or some can even fall back to Earth, which again is only cool in movies with superheroes who can relatively easily deal with this stuff. Hopefully, we'll avoid a massive solar storm like the Carrington event. The story was similar. In August 1859, astronomers across the globe watched how the number of sunspots was getting bigger and bigger. A man named Richard Carrington was among them. At the beginning of September, he was sketching the sunspots when, out of a sudden, he was blinded by a flash of light. It lasted around five minutes, but it was spectacular. He later described it as a white light flare. It was a very strong coronal mass ejection CME, and in only 17.6 hours, this storm crossed the long way between the sun and our home planet, 90 million miles, and unleashed its force on us, even though this usually takes days. And when this storm started, telegraph machines across the world sparked. Operators got electric shocks, and paper even caught fire. 
people were really scared and confused because they had never seen such bright skies before. Some even thought it was the end of the world. The next day, telegraph workers still couldn't work properly because Earth's atmosphere was still charged. They even managed to send messages using the auroral current instead of regular electricity. But it brought something incredible, two stunning auroras in the sky. People in Hawaii and Cuba could see beautiful northern lights, while those as far north as Chile could see the southern lights. It's all slowly but steadily escalating. Take solar flares, for example. These are powerful bursts of energy from the sun. In 2022, there were five times more of these flares compared to the previous year. Plus the strongest ones, X-class flares, have been getting stronger and more common than before, too. And this might be way more extreme than anyone thought. Plus, it's likely to start a little bit earlier than we predicted. Scientists first thought the peak would happen in 2025, but it seems it could even occur by the end of 2023. We can't completely protect ourselves if a solar storm hits us directly, but we can still do some things, like ground planes, adjust the paths of satellites in space, and try to make sure vulnerable infrastructure stays safe. To do all this, we need better solar weather forecasts to help us get ready for the worst. All this might sound very bad at first, but don't worry, solar flares won't destroy our planet. They do send charged solar material toward us at pretty high speeds, but it's not like we're completely doomed if these things hit us. Our planet won't leave us unprotected. We still have the atmosphere and magnetic field that keep us relatively safe. Our thick atmosphere is like a shield that blocks radiation that might harm us. So these solar flares can mostly affect technology, but they won't destroy Earth. I guess we have our own superheroes after all. The Hubble Space Telescope was put into a low Earth orbit in 1990. If you think about it, it's had over 30 years of experience looking at various space objects. It was named after astronomer Edwin Hubble and was built by NASA. It is also part of a group of devices called NASA's Great Observatories, along with the Compton Gamma Ray Observatory, the Chandra X-ray Observatory, and the Spitzer Space Telescope. The Hubble Space Telescope was built to explore the universe and answer some of its biggest questions, such as how galaxies form and evolve, and how the universe itself has changed over time. The telescope has made many important discoveries, including providing evidence of the existence of dark matter and helping to determine the rate of expansion of the universe. One of the most famous images taken by the Hubble Space Telescope is the Pillars of Creation. It's a photo of a region of the Eagle Nebula, where new stars are born. The photo, which was taken in 1995, shows massive pillars of gas and dust towering above the nebula. It has become one of the most iconic images of the universe. The Hubble Space Telescope continues to operate and make important scientific discoveries, despite some initial technical difficulties. In 1993, a problem with the telescope's main mirror was discovered, which affected its ability to focus light properly. A repair mission was sent to the telescope in 1994 to fix the problem. And since then, the telescope has continued to work perfectly. One of the more interesting discoveries made by this amazing telescope is actually pretty recent. A report based on the data from the Hubble Space Telescope shows that there is a faint glow in space around the solar system that cannot be explained by anything we know to exist. Because they have yet to figure out the source, astronomers call this mysterious glow ghost light. We don't know that this light is not coming from the stars or galaxies near the solar system, nor is it coming from dust on the solar system's plane. The researchers aren't sure what the source of the light is, but they think it might be tiny particles of dust and ice left by comets. But it's only a theory that has not yet been confirmed. When we study the universe, we often find bright things like planets, stars, and galaxies. But from time to time, we discover some light coming from places where we didn't expect to see it, like from between planets. This light may be coming from deep within our solar system, and it may be a new phenomenon that hasn't been studied before. In other words, there may be something at the center of our galaxy that produces a lot of light. Spacecraft Voyager 1 also captured images showing a lot of light coming from the edge of our solar system. How come we haven't noticed this until now? 
Well, because most of the light in pictures taken by the Hubble telescope comes from things close to Earth. But people usually ignore this light because they're interested in things like stars and galaxies that are farther away. We've never actually looked closely at the amount of light in the universe and where it comes from. Scientists have been using the Hubble to find faint galaxies that may have been missed before and which may be the source of this dim glow. They found that there are not enough such galaxies to account for extra light in the sky. It's not a lot of light, though. It's like the glow from 10 fireflies. But it doesn't make it less important. It shows that we may be missing something. Let's look at some other important discoveries we've made with the help of Hubble. Like dark matter, which we can't see but know is there because of its effect on gravity. It makes up for about 23% of the universe. By looking at how it affects light, the Hubble telescope helped make 3D maps of where dark matter is. These maps show that dark matter seems to be getting clumpier over time, which means it behaves very similarly to how gravity does. The Hubble telescope also discovered two new moons around Pluto, named Nix and Hydra, and studied the dwarf planet's changing surface. Additionally, it's found the mass of planet Eris, which is larger than Pluto. This helps scientists realize there may be similar objects in the Kuiper Belt, a region outside our solar system. This led to Pluto being reclassified as a dwarf planet. Further observations of these distant objects could help us understand the evolution of our solar system. Gamma-ray bursts are the most powerful explosions in the universe. And for a long time, no one knew where they had been coming from. Hubble helped us find out that these bursts happen in galaxies, producing a lot of stars and having few heavy elements. This suggests that gamma-ray bursts happen when big stars collapse into black holes. These galaxies have lots of big stars that fall apart quickly, and the stars there don't have much heavy stuff, so they can turn into black holes. In 1994, the Shoemaker-Levy 9 comet collided with Jupiter. Hubble captured the whole event in detail, like a resourceful journalist. The impact broke the comet into a lot of small pieces, which resulted in 21 other visible collisions. The largest impact created a fireball and a dark spot on Jupiter's surface. Hubble's observations not only sparked public interest in cosmic impacts, but also provided new insights into Jupiter's atmosphere. To move forward with our list of discoveries made by the Hubble telescope, we also need to talk about black holes. There are points in space where gravity has so much force that even light cannot escape it. The gravity becomes so strong that matter gets squeezed into a very small space. We know that this can happen when a star, like the Sun, nears the end of its life. At the beginning of its life, a star's hydrogen ignites in its dense hot core. Because of gravity, it tries to draw its own mass into a tiny point. As long as it has the energy generated by the hydrogen fusion, it also pushes outward. If we look at it this way, the life of a star depends on a delicate balance between these forces, and it can last millions or even billions of years. Once that energy is exhausted, the only force remaining is that of gravity. So, some stars become black holes. Since light itself cannot escape its pull, we can't visualize black holes. For the human eye, they are invisible. We need special tools and unique telescopes to help us point them out in the universe. Hubble found that most galaxies with a central bulge of stars likely have supermassive black holes. It also noticed a strong connection between the size of these black holes and their host galaxies, which might help us understand how the universe has changed over time. Then what is a supermassive black hole, you might ask? Go ahead, ask it. It is a very large black hole that is typically found at the center of a galaxy. It is millions or even billions of times more massive than our Sun. These black holes are so powerful that they can swallow stars and even entire galaxies. Scientists are still exploring these mysterious objects, but they believe that they play a crucial role in the formation and evolution of galaxies. Now, before Hubble, we really didn't know how old the universe was. It often led to weird paradoxes, like the one where stars discovered by astronomers were older than the universe itself. 
But by figuring out the approximate rate at which the universe is expanding, Hubble helped us narrow down its age, which is about 13.75 billion years. Trying to figure out the exact age of the universe is an important question. That's because most astronomers think that the universe has not existed forever, but appeared in one really hot and dense fireball called the Big Bang. I wasn't around then. From thousands of dollars worth of treasure to brand new phones and ancient cities, let's dive into the water and see what we can find. Imagine going to the river to enjoy a boat ride. Who wouldn't want to take a couple of pics to make the memories of this trip last forever? Oops, the water splash. Luckily, you've taken precautions and put your gadget in a waterproof bag. But what if you drop your phone to the bottom of the lake along with this case? This is what happened to some people. A scuba diver and a YouTuber dived into a river popular with tourists and lost some of their gear worth $20,000, including new iPhones and some jewelry. Oops. You might be familiar with the image of a car getting pulled out of the water, either from the movies or TV news. Large cargo vessels sometimes sink and trucks inside them go along. That's what happened with the Thistlegorm wreck. It sunk in 1941 in the Red Sea, and these Bedford trucks were inside. Want to see something more valuable, like treasure? A British cargo ship was carrying a heavy load of silver ingots, but the vessel sank. Treasure seekers knew there was silver on the ship. Since the 1940s, they've been looking for it. The Odyssey Marine team got lucky. They made the discovery in 2011. The treasure was more than 14,000 feet below the surface. The ship had carried more than 110 tons of silver ingots. Finders keepers! The Odyssey team kept 80% of the treasure and gave 20% to Her Majesty's Treasury. Of course, there were more items on the ship, like letters, teapots, and silk sheets. You can see them in the exhibition called Voices from the Deep at London's Postal Museum. Now how about some underwater art? Sure, here you go! Polynesian Moai statues. These statues have been discovered in several areas across the world. For instance, Easter Island is full of different size statues, but many of them can also be found in Cancun, Isla Mueras, and Punta Nizu, Mexico. Seeing full-body statues from thousands of years ago under the water would probably be a lifetime experience. Gold coins are also popular items found in shipwrecks. Many divers come across coins worth a lot of money. But there's one diver in Florida who truly hit the jackpot. In 2015, they stumbled upon nearly $1 million worth of treasure. The discovery was 51 gold coins, 40 feet of ornate gold chains, and a rare coin that was made for Philip V, the King of Spain. They were once frightening and dangerous, and they still look spooky. Yo-ho! I'm talking about pirate ships. One pirate shipwreck from the 18th century was excavated off the coast of Colombia in 2015. The treasure found there was worth between 4 and 17 billion dollars. It contained precious stones, gold, and many other items. The next one is an underwater city. Neapolis is a city washed away by a tsunami. It was built on the coast of North Africa nearly 1,700 years ago. Divers uncovered the city's remains in 2017. Researchers have also discovered Roman columns, as well as household goods and tools. Now, let's go all the way back to 1503. Portuguese explorer Vasco da Gama was fighting a storm when he lost his ship Esmeralda. The ship was discovered in 1998, but it had to wait for more than a decade to be excavated. Researchers found navigational tools there. They didn't have as much value as Spanish gold, but they were historical treasures. Now, in Amsterdam, they fish for bikes in canals. One third of working Amsterdammers cycle to work. Others use their bikes for different purposes, like exercising, going shopping, and so on. There are more bikes in Amsterdam than permanent residents. 
Unfortunately, many bicycles and even some cars end up in Amsterdam's canals. The fact that Amsterdam has 165 canals with a combined length of 60 miles doesn't make the authorities' job easier. Obviously, the owners don't throw their bikes into the water. Bikes can end up in the canals because of strong winds, vandalism, theft, or by accident. Every year, authorities fish up between 12,000 and 15,000 bikes. Our next one is a lost city. Heraklion was ancient Egypt's gateway to the Mediterranean. It became submerged and hidden under the sand. This city was famous. Maybe you've even heard about it. It was mentioned in the legend about Helen from Sparta and Paris from Troy. So how was this ancient city discovered? In the early 2000s, a team of divers found a huge fragment of rock on the seabed and took it up to dry land. It turned out that it was a piece of the statue of Hapi, who was the lord of the river of ancient Egyptians. The team continued searching and found six other pieces. Around them, they saw temple ruins, pieces of pottery, jewelry, coins, oil lamps, and so on. Even an old copy of the New York Times. Nah, not really. Granada Underwater Sculpture Park is the world's first, what else, underwater sculpture park. Why is this park so special, besides being located in the beautiful waters of the Caribbean? You can see the park on a snorkeling or scuba diving trip. The sculptures are about 9 to 16 feet underwater. The atmosphere and the experience itself make it special. The sculptures are made from concrete and steel. Some of them weigh as much as 15 tons. They're covered with underwater creatures. The statues were put there to help protect reefs, maintain the health of the ecosystem, and restore underwater life in that area. Now, submarines are designed to go underwater, so maybe you wouldn't expect to see them on this list. But submarines do, in fact, sink. Divers have discovered many submarines. For instance, an Australian submarine was found off the coast of Papua New Guinea more than a century after it had sunk. Now here's another submerged city, but this one was left underwater on purpose. You can see the ancient ruins of Lion City in a lake in China. This lake was created in 1959 when the valley, at the base of Five Lions Mountain, was flooded to create a hydroelectric power station. The 1,400-year-old city, now ruins, got submerged by this flow and stayed this way for over 50 years. It lay untouched at the bottom of the lake until its exploration started in 2001. Divers found out that many structures, carvings, guardian lions, and arches were still preserved. Researchers mapped and documented Lion City. They also looked for a way to protect these structures from further damage. In 2011, the city was announced to be an historic relic under protection. When you see the ruins of Lion City for the first time, the view will take your breath away. So don't forget to hold your breath. Imagine swimming in the dark waters. As you're approaching the city, you see its huge walls and extensive carvings. Marvelous, isn't it? The Cancun Underwater Museum is probably the largest museum of its kind in the whole world. It wasn't lost, per se, but now it's home to an aquatic ecosystem. Who wouldn't want to combine scuba diving and snorkeling with a visit to a world-class garden with 500 sculptures? Placed 30 feet under the surface, these sculptures are made from pH-neutral marine concrete so that they can stay on the ocean floor. Plus, here, the sculptures change over time, unlike in a traditional museum. That's because they become part of the underwater environment and a home to various plant and animal species. In one installation, nearly 450 life-size figurines are grouped together to hint at the harmonious coexistence of humanity. There is also the Anthropocene, which is an actual submerged Volkswagen Beetle placed by the Manchonis Reef. Okay, this is not a lost and found item, but this is just… hey, it's a giant jellyfish and I wanted you to see it. This creature is known as the lion's mane jellyfish and is the largest known species of jellyfish. So, I'm happy now. And have you ever discovered anything underwater? 
Our universe is full of both amazing and terrifying things. You already know about quasars, black holes, dark matter, and so on. But how about the horrors of space that you haven't even heard of? Would you like to visit the most bizarre worlds in the universe? And it's not me who made this list, but NASA themselves. Welcome to the Galaxy of Horrors, NASA's awesome Halloween collection. Please join me on a journey to some planets and tell me which ones you would consider the most horrible. Buckle up. Our first destination is a gas giant called Tress-2b. It's located 750 light years away from us. If we used a regular spaceship, it would take us about 10 million years to get there. Tress-2b orbits a yellow dwarf, a star similar to our sun. It also weighs about 1.5 times more than Jupiter. So, what's so special about it? Well, if you're afraid of the dark, you definitely don't want to visit this place. It's the planet of eternal night, the darkest one of all the planets known to us. But it's not that far from its star, so why is that? The thing is, the surface of Tress 2b reflects light even worse than coal does. Because of this, it seems that there's no light at all. If you were flying across the surface of this planet, it would be like walking with a blindfold on your eyes. Oh wait, actually there is some light. An eerie deep red glow surrounds the surface of the planet. This glow is created by the burning atmosphere, which makes Tress 2b a scorching planet. The air there is even hotter than lava. Oh, but if you think that was bad, let me show you the next place of our horror journey. NASA wasn't beating about the bush while nicknaming this one. Now, we're not just talking about one planet, but three at once. They're also located quite far away, 2300 light years from the sun. We would have reached them by ship in about 35 million years. All the planets are in the constellation Virgo, and each is extremely light, much lighter than the Earth. These three exoplanets are called Poltergeist, Dragger, and Phobator. <laughs> cool names, huh? It's because each of these planets is about to become a ghost soon. The thing is, they don't revolve around a star, but around a pulsar. Pulsars are rotating neutron stars with an extremely powerful magnetic field. In simple words, these are the stars that exploded one day. After the explosion, they usually emit such a powerful pulse that it causes the star to rotate at an unimaginable speed. Several thousand rotations per second. At the same time, they constantly emit electromagnetic pulses that affect everything around them. So, you've probably already guessed what's happening with our zombie planets. They're slowly, gradually being destroyed under the gigantic influence of radiation. One day, they'll disappear without a trace. Ghost-like planets orbiting an undead star? Yeah, zombie world is a fitting name. It's also not surprising that scientists nicknamed this pulsar Lich despite the long official name. Well, at least these guys stick together on their final dance. This planet has a long name, so bear with me. HD 189733b. This gas giant is 65 light years away from us. It would have taken around 1 million years to get there on a spaceship. HD, um, well, this planet is slightly more massive than Jupiter and orbits its star, an orange dwarf, all alone. At first glance, it may seem friendly. A pleasant blue color and curls on the surface. Kind of resembles a summer sky or foam on sea waves, right? Oh, looks are very deceptive, my friend. This planet has a pleasant cobalt blue color due to the hazy blow-torched atmosphere. This atmosphere contains silicates that condense when heated. In other words, the clouds on this planet have rain made of glass. Yes, it rains hot glass shards here. Oh, and if that's not enough, there's a raging wind on the surface, which is moving at a speed of 5,400 miles per hour. Just to compare, the fastest wind on Earth had a speed of 254 miles per hour, about 20 times weaker. And because of this, hundreds of thousands of glass shards rush horizontally across the planet's surface at breakneck speed. I really don't envy anyone who would want to try to land there. By the way, this isn't the only example of strange rains in our universe. For example, it rains molten iron on the planet Domitium. Or let's take so-called carbon planets. 
Their existence hasn't yet been proven, but if they do exist, there would be tons of black poisonous clouds, and it would rain pure gasoline and hot liquid asphalt. Oh, and also, raindrops would explode upon touching the surface. Eh, nothing special. The next planet, though, is actually really strange. It didn't just revolve around its star, it lived inside the star. This cosmic miracle is called Koi 55b, or Kepler 70b. This planet is very far away from us, 4,000 light years. It would take about 70 million years on a spaceship. It's twice as light as Earth and fully rotates around its star in just a couple of hours. A long time ago, it was an ordinary Earth-like planet about the size of Jupiter. It was peacefully and calmly orbiting its red dwarf star, Koi 55. But everything changed about 700 million years ago. Perhaps you've heard that in a couple billion years, our sun will begin to expand into a huge star, absorbing everything in its path. Well, this is the fate of red dwarfs. Sooner or later, they increase, turning into incredibly hot blue giants. The same thing happened with Koi 55. This star began to increase in size and heat up in temperature, gradually turning into a blue-white giant. It was ready to devour its nearest planets, but Koi 55b didn't care about it. When the star reached it, this planet just settled inside. And moreover, after some time, it left its star, simply returning to the new orbit. How was that even possible? Life inside its star turned Koi 55b into a red-hot round stone. It's one of the hottest planets we've discovered so far. The temperature on it reaches 12,000 degrees Fahrenheit. It's hotter than the sun, which is, let me remind you, an actual star. And for some reason, it's still alive and lives as if nothing happened. Unfortunately, sooner or later, the planet will disappear anyway. It's slowly evaporating itself due to the incandescent atmosphere. But still, it somehow managed to survive the journey through the star, which isn't typical for regular planets, to put it mildly. I envy this willpower. However, not all planets are so lucky. Some are gradually being destroyed by their stars, and there is even an entire system among them. This last planet is a sad loner. It's located 870 light years away from us. The journey by ship to it would take about 25 million years. This planet is about 1.5 times more massive than Jupiter. This is a very sad, dark planet. A doomed gas giant, which is very similar to hot Jupiter, orbits its star all alone. At the same time, it's located so close to its star that its orbital period takes just one day. Of course, because of this proximity, the star gradually absorbs WASP-12b. The scorching heat of the star is slowly destroying and devouring the planet's atmosphere. The planet has only around 10 million years left. But what's more interesting, because of this stretching, WASP-12b acquired the shape of an egg. It doesn't even resemble an actual planet anymore. It's also very hot. The surface temperature of the gas giant reaches 4,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Also, a spectrograph of cosmic origin, or COS for short, found that the planet exchanges matter with its star. They're located so close that they give each other part of their chemical elements. This is a common phenomenon in closely spaced binary star systems, but this is the first time scientists have seen this in a star-planet relationship. What a unique system. To be honest, if I was guaranteed complete security, I'd be excited to visit at least some of them. What about you? Please let me know in the comments. Hey, wake up! Quick, listen to that. It's a 5-second FM signal coming from one of Jupiter's moons. You fumble for your phone and inform your colleagues. They freak out over the news and rush to the lab. You've been a scientist working with the Juno probe, exploring Jupiter for years. But this is the first time you've witnessed something so unusual. Ganymede is Jupiter's largest moon and the biggest moon in our solar system. If this space body didn't orbit around Jupiter, it would be classified as a planet. It's even bigger than Mercury and Pluto. What makes this moon stand out among others is the fact that it has its own magnetic field. The moon was born around 4.5 billion years ago. It means it's as old as Jupiter itself. This planet-sized space body takes 7 Earth days to orbit its planet. Everyone gathers at the laboratory, impatiently waiting for you to play the recording of the signal coming from space. 
your colleagues get their game on, trying to figure out what the source of this mysterious sound is. Around 40% of Ganymede's surface is dark, with craters scattered around. And 60% is light-colored. There are formations that were probably caused by tectonic activity or the release of water from under the surface. Scientists managed to discover a thin layer of oxygen trapped in the Moon's atmosphere. The temperatures there are super low, between minus 170 to minus 200 degrees Fahrenheit. There isn't much information about how the Moon behaves or what chemical elements it hides inside. Some of your colleagues try to create the same conditions that existed when the sound was transmitted. For hours, they sit there waiting, but nothing. Maybe it was a fluke. You get to the control system and activate the Juno spacecraft. The main point of this mission is to observe Jupiter's gravity, magnetic fields, the atmosphere, and the planet's evolution. By the way, there's also some evidence that Jupiter's largest moon is evolving too. Since it has a magnetic field surrounding it, auroras pop up all the time. Those are glowing gas circling the moon's north and south poles. If life existed in such a place, it would probably be at the bottom of Ganymede's extremely salty ocean. For a long time, scientists thought that the sun was a crucial component to kickstart life. But now we know that there are organisms dwelling deep at the bottom of the oceans. Those are doing just fine without sunlight. The oceans of our planet are teeming with some of the most bizarre creatures of all shapes and sizes. Sea lilies live some 10,000 feet underwater. They got their name because they look like flowers. Except they're not plants, but animals. Don't be fooled by their stems and leaves. Those are body parts equipped with nerve endings to detect food around them. Goblin sharks are probably some of the most weird-looking sharks that live at the bottom of the ocean. They can grow up to 12 feet long and have a very unusual snout. Now, take a look at the anglerfish. It has a bioluminescent blob on its head to attract prey and navigate its way around the dark ocean floor. It's a natural flashlight that never needs new batteries. It's only the females that have these flashlights, though. The blobfish is another bizarre animal living down there. It lives in the Atlantic, Pacific, and Indian Oceans, 9,000 feet under the surface. Anyway, even though you asked everyone to keep the news confidential, it somehow leaks to the media and becomes a new trending topic. You get a call from a news agency. They say they want to interview you about this breakthrough that may prove life exists in outer space. The next day, you head down to the news station to talk about your discovery. You have a whole live studio audience watching your every move as you reach out to grab your glass of water. The crew scurries around doing some last-minute checkups before you're live on air. The makeup artist does some final brush-ups. The sound engineer asks you to test your mic once more. Several of the producers are sitting in the front seats. Bright lights are flooding the studio. The countdown begins. 3, 2, 1, and... You're introduced and the host asks you to explain what it was that you heard. You tell them about the Juno space probe orbiting Jupiter. After a couple of questions, the host finally brings up the most dreaded one. Might the mysterious sound be coming from another civilization? Everyone leans in, waiting for you to answer. You freeze, not knowing what to say. Even though the crushing pressure at the bottom of the ocean is a thousand times stronger than at sea level, life still exists there. Algae, which is considered a delicacy in the ocean world, is off-menu for deep-sea creatures due to a lack of sunlight. Many of these bottom-dwellers have to munch on leftovers instead. Those sink down there from the upper layers of the ocean. The freezing temperatures and the intense pressure have altered the cells of these creatures. This has made them more resilient than the average fish. Bacteria were developing their own ways of surviving. Studies show that they feed on certain gases and chemicals, like sulfur and carbon dioxide. Methane and hydrogen are released when tectonic plates move against each other. And some of these bacteria feast upon those gases too. Tardigrades, also known as water bears, are microscopic critters that can live and thrive in extreme conditions. You can find them in volcanoes, frozen glaciers, and even in the empty void of space. Which means that some life forms might actually exist on Ganymede. You explain this to your audience. Then you mention that you don't have enough information to determine if it was another civilization or a natural phenomenon that produced the sound. 
This doesn't mean that the bottom of Ganymede's freezing oceans isn't teeming with its own bizarre and weird creatures. There might be some legendary beasts like the Kraken or Leviathan there. Or weird glowing fish with two heads. A fish with tentacles and a large fin. Giant crabs. The bacteria there might be as varied as our own. The plants, if they exist there, have to be strong enough to survive the sub-zero temperatures. The animals on Jupiter's largest moon could be as big as our blue whales or as tiny as plankton. After the interview, you head back to the lab to examine the records once more. On your way home, you see posters of yourself with captions like, Are we not alone? Hey, you've become a celebrity! Many people take pictures of you. You've been booked by other agencies for more interviews. Some science magazines even want to put you on the front cover as the person of the year. Every time you come to work, you wait for the sound to appear again. But nothing. You send a signal from the Juno probe, trying to make some sort of contact with whatever produced the sound. Nothing. That night, you pass out on your desk once more. Eureka moment wakes you up in the middle of the night. There might be something you've missed. You run the numbers again and realize that the answer was in front of you this whole time. It wasn't another civilization that produced this sound. The source was electrons. Every planet produces its own sound. It's created when charged particles from the solar wind and the planet's magnetosphere interact with one another. That's what happened on Ganymede. The electrons in its magnetic field, where the probe picked up the signal, were acting stranger than usual, and this amplified some irregular frequencies. You're embarrassed and spend the rest of your night making phone calls, telling your team the news. The agency that interviewed you releases a statement. They explain that other civilizations aren't trying to contact us. You sit back at your desk, waiting for the next big thing to happen. Europa is another of Jupiter's moons that may host life. It's made up of an iron core, a mantle, and a salty ocean, twice the volume of all the oceans on Earth. And just like Ganymede, the ocean lies under a water ice crust. Scientists claim that there might even be active volcanoes there, and some resilient bacteria may live there. With enough water, certain chemicals, and a source of energy, Europa could produce life. But it's unlikely that we'll find anything but tiny microbes. The moon is the second brightest object in our sky. At the same time, among other astronomical bodies, it's one of the dimmest and least reflective. Our natural satellite only seems bright because it's so close to Earth. For comparison, our planet looks much brighter when you look at it from space. It's because clouds, ice, and snow reflect way more light than most types of rock. Triton, Neptune's moon, has all its surface covered with several layers of ice. If this satellite replaced our current moon, the night sky would get seven times brighter. The closer the moon is to the horizon, the larger it looks. This phenomenon is called the moon illusion. One of the theories explaining it claims that the atmosphere plays the role of a magnifying glass, which makes the moon look bigger. In reality, if the atmosphere had a say in it, the moon would actually look smaller, not bigger. Most experts believe that the illusion is created by your own mind. It can increase the moon's size more than twice. When Earth's satellite is high up in the sky, you don't have any visual cues about how far away it is. But when it's near the horizon, you can see objects surrounding it in detail. It makes the moon look larger. But it's just one of the many theories explaining the phenomenon. By the way, you can trick yourself out of this illusion if you bend down and look at the moon upside down through your legs. Two or three years ago, an asteroid was pulled into Earth's orbit and started to travel around the planet. Even though it's no larger than an average car, it's still a big deal. Out of more than one million asteroids astronomers know about, it's only the second one to orbit our planet. Called 2020 CD3, it's our temporary mini-moon. It won't be with Earth for long, though. The asteroid is following a random orbit and is slowly drifting away. Temporarily captured objects, 
such as 2020's CD3, are rare. They need to have specific direction and speed to be caught by Earth's gravitational pull. Otherwise, they either crash into the planet or fly in another direction. A transient lunar phenomenon is one of the most enigmatic things happening on the Moon. It's a short-lived light, color, or some other change on the satellite's surface. Most commonly, it's random flashes of light. Astronomers have been observing this phenomenon since the 1950s. They've noticed that the flashes occur randomly. Sometimes, they can happen several times a week. After that, they disappear for several months. Some of them don't last longer than a couple of minutes. But there have been those that continued for hours. The year was 1969, one day before Apollo 11 landed on the moon. One of the mission participants noticed that one part of the natural satellite was more illuminated than the surrounding landscape. It looked as if that area had a kind of fluorescence to it. Unfortunately, it's still unclear if this phenomenon was connected with the mysterious lunar flashes. There might be more metals, for example, titanium or iron, in lunar craters than astronomers used to think. The main problem with this finding? It contradicts the main theory about how the moon was formed. That theory says that Earth's natural satellite was spun off from our planet after a collision with a massive space object. But then, why does Earth's metal-poor crust have much less iron oxide than the moon's? It might mean the moon formed from the material lying much deeper inside our planet. Or these metals could have appeared when the molten lunar surface was slowly cooling down. The moon's gravity is about 17% of that on Earth. If you weighed 200 pounds on our home planet, on the moon, your weight would decrease to a mere 34 pounds. You would also be able to carry stuff six times heavier than what you can carry on Earth. It would be easier to walk on the moon's surface, but it would be more dangerous too. Your feet inside a heavy spacesuit would sink into the lunar soil up to six inches deep. But let's imagine you decided to skip the tedious process of walking by leaping through the air. Then you'd likely lose control of your jumps in no time. Plus, the moon's surface is littered with deep craters. It would be a tough feat to avoid all of them. Not so long ago, astronomers discovered a massive blob of some mysterious substance. It was hidden under the surface of the moon's far side. Its mass was the same as that of a pile of metal five times larger than the big island of Hawaii. The enigmatic something lies almost 200 miles beneath an enormous crater that appeared in the lunar surface billions of years ago. The blob likely has something to do with a super collision. It might be the metal core of the object that hit the moon back then. Scientists can't wait to lay their hands on the discovery. It could explain lots of things about the South Pole Aitken Crater, the largest known in the solar system. If it was on Earth, its oval-shaped basin would stretch from Washington, D.C. to Texas. There's no air on Earth's natural satellite, but then how can it be rusting? Scientists have discovered the presence of hematite on the moon, and it's a kind of rust. A special NASA research instrument examined the light reflected off the moon's surface. It turned out that the composition of the satellite's poles was very different from the rest of it. The moon's surface is dotted with iron-rich rocks, but without oxygen and liquid water, rust can't appear. Solar winds add to the mystery. They bombard the moon with hydrogen, and hydrogen makes it much more difficult for hematite to form. But even though the moon doesn't have an atmosphere, it still has some trace amounts of oxygen. Its source is our planet's upper atmosphere. Earth also protects the moon from almost 100% of solar winds, although not all the time. And even though our natural satellite is bone dry, there might be water ice in the shadowed craters on its far side. The moon isn't a perfect sphere. It's shaped like an egg. Plus, the satellite's center of mass is a bit more than a mile off its geometric center. 
the Earth and the Moon are gradually drifting apart, as slowly as your fingernails grow. This is the flip side of our satellite's gravitational force. The Moon creates tides in the Earth's oceans. They pull back at the Moon and make it speed up. This, in turn, moves the satellite to a higher orbit. In prehistoric times, the Moon was way closer to our planet than it is now. Luckily, we aren't going to lose the Moon. The farther away it moves, the weaker its gravitational pull becomes. It means that soon, our planet won't be pushing the Moon away with such a force. There's very little activity going on inside the Moon. Plus, there's almost no atmosphere around. That's why scientists can trace impact craters littering the satellite surface back billions of years. While dating the craters, astronomers discovered that the Moon, along with our planet, went through a late heavy bombardment about 4 billion years ago. This event is also known as the Lunar Cataclysm. This interval lasted several hundred millions of years. During it, an unusually large number of asteroids collided with Earth, Mercury, Mars, and Venus. There might be a labyrinth of lava tubes on the Moon. Not long ago, astronomers received the results of an underground lunar topography. They discovered a massive cave under the satellite's surface, about 30 miles long and 60 miles wide. The cave's likely to be the result of 3 billion year old volcanic activity. After streams of lava hardened, they created a thick hard crust on the outside. But inside, lava kept flowing, melting the rock and forming tunnels and caves. Countless pits in the moon's surface, discovered by NASA, might be the openings to lava tubes. The moon's orbit around the Earth isn't a circle, it's an oval. That's why the distance between our planet and the satellite varies from over 225,000 miles to more than 250,000 miles. There's very little seismic activity going on inside the moon. Yet, many moon quakes caused by our planet's gravitational pull sometimes happen several miles below the surface. After that, tiny cracks and fractures appear in the satellite's surface and gases escape through them. 